Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the Physicians and Midwives Collaborative Practice Easy Pass class. I'm Patricia Gould. I'm the head midwife for the practice. And we just want to welcome you here. We're glad you chose physicians and midwives for your prenatal care and your childbirth experience. We're here to assure you to, that you would have a safe and happy childbirth experience, hopefully the one of your dreams. Um, we are a collaborative practice, which means you have the opportunity to see physicians, midwives, nurse practitioners, all during the course of your prenatal care. You can see whoever you would like to see for your visits um, because we all work together as one team collaboratively. Um, I don't know how many of you know what a midwife is or what kind of training midwives have or how many of you sought out this practice specifically for midwifery care, but let me just say that midwives are nurses and they are advanced practice nurses so all of the nurse midwives that you meet in this practice have a bachelor's degree in nursing and a master's degree in nursing. And we have done what we refer to as a clinical residency in low risk obstetrics. We are experts in natural childbirth and low risk childbirth. The difference in how midwives in our practice um, function compared to most midwifery practices is that because we're a fully collaborative practice and we always have a physician partner with us at the hospital, we are able to accept all women with very, very few exceptions into our practice. We don't risk out women based on um, high risk factors because we believe that every woman deserves midwifery care, that kinder, gentler, more attentive approach to your childbirth and prenatal care experience. So again, you may see anybody that you would like to during the course of your care. Um, we desire to have a bond of trust with you. It is our goal to treat each and every one of you the way we would the people most dear to us, whether they're our sisters, our daughters, our daughters-in-law, or our very best friends. You can rest assured that we're going to always give you the very same advice that we would give to those people in our lives. We're never going to tell you unnecessarily that you have to do things that aren't in accordance with your birth plan, only in a, in a case where it is not in the best interest or safe for you or your baby. Few things housekeeping wise that we want you to be aware of when you're at the beginning of this journey with us is that we do only deliver at Alexandria Inova Hospital. We are a part of the Inova Health System here but our practice delivers only at this hospital. I know some people assume because we're aff affiliated with Inova that you could go to Fairfax or any Fair Oaks, any of the other hospitals, but you can't. We only deliver here. And though this is not the newest, nor shiniest, nor prettiest women's hospital within the Inova system, we believe this is the best hospital, and I'll tell you why. Our practice, Physicians and Midwives, has been delivering babies at this hospital for over 35 years. We also are the largest practice that delivers here, far and away more babies than any other practice. So by default, the culture of nursing at this hospital is our kinder, gentler approach to childbirth. The nursing staff here knows and appreciates that if they're taking care of a physicians and midwives, patient, they know that the midwife and the physician are both here 24-7. Our doctors do 24-hour call shifts, our midwives do 12-hour call shifts, and we take call from the hospital. Therefore, if we have a patient that's here in labor um, or being triaged or assessed for labor, the midwife or the physician will be the one who is assessing that patient, who is doing all of the checks for that patient. The nurses don't do internal exams on our patients unless there's an emergent situation that they need to and they have our permission to. There are no residents or medical students who are putting hands on our patients. Only the physician and the midwife on call for our practice would be involved in our patient's care. The other little piece of that I like to mention is that I know a lot of you out there are on blogs and you read and you're scared to death of having a C-section for no good reason. 
And I'd like to assure you that again, because our physicians are at this hospital for 24 consecutive hours, they are not going to their son's piano recital or taking their wife to dinner or going golfing. So you're never going to have a situation where a physician says, you have until five o'clock to get this baby out. And if you don't, we're gonna do a C-section because I have something I have to do. That doesn't happen in this practice. So we want you to all relax and understand that the only time we would ever come and speak to you about a C-section would be if there was a, a, a sincere concern that you needed to have a C-section. We do have our motto of convenient, compassionate care, and to that end, we have five offices throughout the Northern Virginia area. We have our main office, our Kenmore office, here on Seminary Road, just three blocks from the hospital. We have a Kingstown office, we have a Lake Ridge office, we have a Boston Arlington office, and we have an office um, across from Mount Vernon Hospital, our Sherwood Hall office. You may be seen at any of those offices at any point. Some people live closest to one and work closest to another. Maybe you have to have an emergency visit for some reason. You can always be seen at any of the offices where we have space to see you. We have an electronic charting system which allows us access to every patient from every single office. So you're never going to get to an office and feel like they don't have all the information because we do have all the information. What we also have are on-site um, laboratory services so that you don't have to go to outside labs and run around to have all of that stuff done. And our own sonography department so that we can do your ultrasounds on-site. Again, keeping in mind we want things to be convenient for you. We do have our own OB Passport app, which you can go to the App Store on your iPhone or your Android phone and you can download for free. It talks all about the PM experience for childbirth. It talks about what to expect during your childbirth. It has all kinds of links that will take you to interesting places, um, give you all sorts of information so you don't have to visit Dr. Google. You can visit our OB Passport app and get your questions answered. If there's still questions that you have after you've consulted your app, we are available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You have an emergency number that you can call during the regular business hours. It's gonna put you in, in touch with our nurses in our triage department in the office. In after hours and in the weekend um, times, you can be connected directly with the midwife on call at the hospital to answer any additional questions that you might have. If you don't feel like it's an emergent question, we have a wonderful portal um, system through our um, office, and you can send a message through the portal to whatever provider you would like, um, asking about lab results or any questions or concerns that you have if you don't consider them to be of an emergent nature. And um, we endeavor to get back with, in touch with you within 24 hours to answer your question or to get those lab results to you. So that's just a little introduction to the PM experience, and we're going to continue now shortly with the Easy Pass class where you can ask all sorts of questions. It is an interactive class, and I encourage you to participate. Thank you. Just welcome. I'm glad you're here. So, y'all shout out answers if you know them, okay? Um, your due date, your esti estimated date of confinement. That's what that means, your EDC, confined. I'm not sure if it's the baby that's confined or you that's confined by the pregnancy, but that's what that means, is based on how many completed weeks of pregnancy. Anybody know? 40. Shout it out. I see. <laughs> 40 weeks of pregnancy. All right. Um, and that is as confirmed by a first trimester sonogram. So typically, most women come in and they have a pretty good idea, if they were planning the pregnancy, they have a pretty good idea of the first day of their last menstrual period because they are planning to get pregnant. So your due date initially is based on your, the first day of your last menstrual period. When you have your first ultrasound, we like to do it between seven and eight weeks. It's called the dating and viability ultrasound. Um, we want the date that we get from that ultrasound that is the 
measurement of the crown rump length of the little baby that's like a little bean at that point. We want that date to coincide within five days of your stated due date on either side. So if you were told that your due date was April 1st by your last menstrual period, we want the measurement calculated date to be somewhere between April 6th and March 25th. We want it to be within five days. If it's beyond that time frame, then we would change your due date, okay? But the only person that would officially change your due date would be your midwife or your doctor or your nurse practitioner. The sonographer doesn't change your due date. So if you hear her talking to herself, which we keep telling them don't do that because you confuse our patients, if you hear her say things like, well, according to your measurement today, your due date would be April 3rd, but you know your due date was April 1st, your due date hasn't been changed. We make a very obvious you know, um, statement to you that we are changing your due date if we change your due date, okay? All right, so your first trimester is from conception to 14 weeks second trimester from 14 to 28, and your third trimester from 28 weeks until you deliver your baby, typically around 40 weeks. Um, return OB visits are called ROB visits, and they are typically scheduled every four weeks until 28 weeks, and then after 28 weeks until 36 weeks, you'll come every two weeks. And then we will see your smiling faces every week, starting at 36 weeks until you deliver. Okay. Established guidelines discourage delivery after 42 weeks. So it is customary in our practice to schedule your induction. If you make it to a week past your due date, we will schedule you for induction. We have very few hard stops in our practice. One of them is nobody goes past 42 weeks, okay? Research over and again has shown that there's not a lot of good things that happen beyond 41 weeks. The placenta's old and it's not functioning as well as it once did. And 42 weeks is our absolute cutoff. Um, natural childbirth is most successful in healthy, fit women. So as I already alluded to earlier, Staying healthy, staying active, having a healthy diet and drinking lots of water and doing a little bit of physical activity will go a long way toward helping you achieve that goal of natural childbirth. All right, you'll refer to me, you, pardon me, you will hear me refer to high risk conditions. Um, and so I'm gonna go over a few of those. This is not in any way an exhaustive list, but if you have chronic hypertension, gestational diabetes, if you're carrying twins, if you are age 38 or above, if you've had a history of a C-section, or if you have lupus, if you have IVF, um, if you've had a prior stillbirth, or kidney disease, or prior pregnancy with pregnancy-induced hypertension, these are all things that would label you high risk in your pregnancy. And if you are high risk, then at some point in your pregnancy, you will be co-managed with our high risk specialists that are here at this hospital. Um, there are other high risk doctors that you can see. The vast majority of our patients see the high risk doctors here. Um, Dr. Gadini and Dr. Poji are the high risk doctors here. They are two of the most intelligent human beings I have ever known. We work very closely with them and we definitely defer to their recommendations for delivery. Um, we offer genetic screening. It is all optional. You do not have to choose any of it. It is to assess risks. Most of that is not diagnostic. Um, there are some invasive procedures that are diagnostic, but we hope that we never have to do any of those. It's under very, strict um, situations or circumstances where we would have to do that. Um, I already talked about the first scheduled ultrasound, that seven to eight week dating and viability ultrasound. Most people do have that done. We encourage that one to be done just so that we know for sure what your due date is. Um, 
The second one is part of our genetic screening. It's called the nuchal translucency ultrasound. It is specifically to assess for risks of Down syndrome. Does everybody know what Down syndrome is? Yes. Okay, so children who are born with Down syndrome have very specific physical characteristics and oftentimes you can, you can see those in the womb even around 12 weeks. It is done between 11 weeks and three days and 13 weeks and six days. It's a very strict time frame. So when we go over the genetic screening options at your new OB appointment, typically around 10 weeks, we will talk to you about that and encourage you to schedule that sonogram when you leave that appointment so that it's scheduled ahead of time. Again, the nuchal translucency ultrasound is part of the optional genetic screening. There are women who say, I don't want any screening at all, and that's fine. And there are women who say, I want everything that my insurance will pay for. I always liked it to the fact that there are typically three different types of outlooks um, concerning all of these things. Number one, there's the patient who says, I would never consider termination, but I'm a planner. And if I can find out early on that there's possibly something wrong with my child, I would like to know that early on so that I can read up on it, so that I can perhaps join support groups for that, so that when my baby gets here, I feel like I'm as prepared as I possibly could be. So that's number one. Number two is a person that says, yeah, I probably wouldn't terminate, but you know what? I'm gonna be an ostrich with my head in the sand. I'm gonna trust that I take what I get at the end of all this. I don't want my pregnancy to be overshadowed or saddened by the knowledge that I have a baby that maybe has a deficit. I wanna just enjoy my pregnancy. Whatever I get at the end, I'm gonna be happy with. And then the third type of person says, I know myself. I know that I cannot handle the idea of having a child that is handicapped. Therefore, I would wanna know as early as I could if there's a possible problem so that I could consider my option of termination. So all three of these perspectives are out there. They are all valid perspectives. We honor all of them. So just depending on where you stand, that will determine or help to determine whether or not you want any or all of the optional um, diagnostic testing that we have available, okay? All right. So the third um, ultrasound that we offer is the only one that is not optional. That's the one that we do at 20 weeks. It's the level two fetal survey. That's where we look at the entire anatomy of the baby to make sure that everything looks like it should. So everybody gets that ultrasound, typically at 20 weeks. If you're seeing the high risk doctors, they, they tend to do it a couple of weeks earlier than that. Um, but we definitely want everybody to have that done around that 20 week time frame, so that we know what is what. Additional sonos are only done for medical necessity. Now, having said that, if we're doing your level two ultrasound at 20 weeks, that is the ultrasound where if you'd like to know the sex of your baby, we can typically tell you that based on that ultrasound. Um, basic lab work is done in the first trimester and you will get stick, sick of us poking you. It's a necessary evil. So at your first visit, your confirmation of pregnancy visit, we will take blood. At your new OB visit, we will take blood. At your nuchal translucency, we will take blood. And then for those of you who choose optional um, genetic screening, that 16 week visit, we will take more blood. And then at 28 weeks, we will take blood. So every pregnant patient at that 28 week visit will have a glucose um, tolerance test, unless you've had gastric bypass stapling mm -hmm. that, or gastric bypass surgery of any kind. Those women, um, we have to kind of do something a little bit different. But everybody gets tested for gestational diabetes at 28 weeks. Some of you will get tested earlier than that based on um, <coughs> risk factors. And we will go over all of that in the in the office visits with you. If we feel like you need to have um, an early glucose screening at 16 or 18 weeks, we will do that for you then as well. Anybody know how much weight you're expected to gain during the pregnancy? 25 to 35 pounds. That's for someone entering pregnancy with a normal BMI. If you are coming into pregnancy and you are already at or around that 200 pound weight, then we encourage you to gain no weight or no more than 15 pounds. Some 
first trimester spotting is normal. But there are some things in the second trimester that I want you to be aware of, just so that you're not frightened by them. First thing is hormonal headaches. So starting about 14 weeks, you can get really, really awful headaches. First thing is that you need to make sure that you're well hydrated. Pregnant, non-pregnant, male, female, most headaches that people suffer from are because they're dehydrated, okay? Pregnancy is the last time in your life you want to be dehydrated. I'm going to go over it later, but a gallon of water a day is the expected, anticipated water intake for a pregnant woman. But if you know that you're hydrated and you're having severe debilitating headaches, you need to let us know. First of all, we would tell you two extra strength Tylenol at the beginning of a headache. Not one 325 milligram when it's been, your headache's been thumping for an hour. No, two 500 milligram Tylenols at the beginning of a headache. Head it off, don't let it get bad. Tylenol is not gonna hurt you, it is not gonna hurt your baby. And you can repeat that dose every six hours if you need to. But if you're needing to take Tylenol more than two doses in a 12 hour period and your headache still is not going away, you should let us know, okay? We can give you something a little stronger to get you through. Fetal movement typically belie believes, typically begins around 20 weeks in a first pregnancy. In second and other subsequent pregnancies, you know what you're feeling for and you can sometimes feel it at 18 weeks. Some people say before that, I don't know, but 18 weeks. Some women will not feel morning or will not feel movement until closer to 22 or 23 weeks if they have a placenta that's in the front. So if at your 20 week ultrasound, they tell you that you have an anterior placenta, that's fine. That just means it's in the front, but it's like a little pillow. It's about this big, about this thick, and it has no nerve ending. So if it's sitting here and your baby's kicking it and bouncing against it and everything, you're not gonna feel that like you would if the baby were kicking you in the uterine wall that has a lot of nerve endings. So typically you won't feel it quite as soon, and when you do, you might feel it out to the sides more than right in the middle, okay? But again, there's nothing wrong with having an anterior placenta. It just means you might be a little bit delayed in feeling the normal fetal movement. The only bad positioning of a placenta is if it's positioned over your cervix or very close to your cervix. That's referred to as a placenta previa, and we hope that most of them will migrate away from the cervix as your stomach gets bigger. Some of them persist on staying down over your cervix. If that's the case, you have to have a C-section because you can't deliver a baby through your placenta. So we watch it and we watch it and we watch it and we hope that it moves away from the cervix so that you can attempt a normal vaginal delivery, but that's not always the case with a previa. And a previa is one of those instances where we will tell you no sex, okay? So if we do that ultrasound at 20 weeks and we see you've got a previa, we're gonna say no sex. The other instance is if you have a shortened cervix and if we're watching your cervix because it's already shortened early in pregnancy or if we have to stitch it closed during pregnancy, which sometimes we do, not often. Um, but if you have a shortened cervix or if you have a placenta previa, those are the two instances where we would tell you no intercourse, okay? Um, what is the most important meal of the day? Breakfast. breakfast. A high protein breakfast. All right, it's like putting the key in the ignition of the car and turning your car on. We want, we want you to have a nice high protein breakfast. It turns on your metabolism so that your metabolism starts burning calories so you don't gain extra weight. And then we want you to eat five to six small snacky meals throughout the day to keep your blood sugar levels stable so that you feel better. So those five to six small meals every day, there are a few things that you should avoid eating when you're pregnant. Sushi, shark meat, um, mackerel, tuna. Um, we don't want you eating unpasteurized cheeses or prepackaged lunch meats. 
okay? But the worst thing that you can eat is junk food. No junk food, people. Now, I realize some of you in the first trimester feel so bad that there are very few things that you can eat, and if junk food is all that you can get down, I guess that's what you have to do to get the calories in. But for, for the most part, we want to discourage eating a lot of junk food, okay? I've already talked about continuing any healthy activities or exercises that your body's accustomed to, but there are a few things you can start at any time. Yoga, swimming, walking, and Pilates. Not mat Pilates, though. That mat Pilates, if you don't do it right, you can get folded into a pretzel right quick. Don't do that. But yoga is excellent. There are all kinds of prenatal yoga classes that you can get involved in. <clears throat> and we do encourage you to start some sort of activity to keep you healthy. Airplane travel. Except if you've been told otherwise, it's perfectly fine to travel up to 34, 36 weeks. If you're 36 weeks pregnant, you probably need to have an, a letter for the airlines. And we want to go over with you some safety measures, things to do during the flight. We want to make sure that it's not too long of a flight and that you have a darn good reason for wanting to get on an airplane at 36 weeks. But most importantly, we want to make sure that you have a, cup, a copy of your prenatal records with you when you travel, if, if you're traveling that late, just in case your water would break or you'd go into labor wherever you were, that you'd have all of that with you and that you're prepared. Okay, you should all be taking prenatal vitamins with folic acid and DHA. I assume that you are. Some of you may want to take some extra supplements of iron or vitamin D3. Um, magnesium is my favorite supplement. It is good for so many things for all humans, but in particular for pregnant women. Um, it helps with insomnia. It helps with constipation. It helps with mental acuity because you'll get that placenta brain. It helps with energy level and it can help also with leg cramps um, and headaches. So an extra magnesium supplement of 500 milligrams a day on top of your prenatal vitamin is acceptable. 3,000 international units of vitamin D3 is really good and an extra iron supplement isn't gonna hurt. So if you want to add those things, you certainly can do so. Um, I already talked about Tylenol. Tylenol is your friend, okay? Two extra strength Tylenol, that's 1,000 milligrams every six hours, is safe for you and your baby. Please do not use Motrin, Advil, or ibuprofen during pregnancy. Um, you can talk to your provider during your visits about that if you have specific questions about that. Please also let us know if you're taking any other prescription medications or supplements. There are certain things that need to be avoided um, during pregnancy, even certain blood pressure medications that we'd wanna switch you to something different during the pregnancy um, if you're already on blood pressure medication. Please avoid artificial sweeteners while you're pregnant. They are neurotoxins and can interfere with, with fetal brain development. So aspartame or aspartame or however you want to pronounce it is not good for you. It's not good for your baby. And you should read some labels um, and, and try to avoid that when you can. The minuses and pluses. The minuses and pluses of natural childbirth? No, both sides, yeah. Well, back in the dark ages when I was having babies, <laughs> we didn't have the option of epidural. Okay, you had IV medication that pretty much made you so loopy that you didn't really know what was going on. Um, or they completely knocked you out. Nowadays, we have options for nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas, like what you get at the dentist office in some instances, um, that is very effective d just during the contractions to put the mask over your face and breathe in the nitrous oxide. This is used universally in Europe all over Europe for, for childbirth. So we have that option. We have much better options now for IV medication that doesn't knock you out completely, but it does take away a lot of the pain of your contractions, it takes the edge off at the very least. And then we have the epidurals. It is much easier to have natural childbirth with second pregnancies. I can't stress that enough. First pregnancies are hard. Second babies come fast and your labor is much more quick, the actual labor itself, 
and then the pushing aspect is so fast. It, sometimes it's one or two pushes and the baby's out versus two or three hours of vigorous pushing to get a first baby out. Um, one of the things with an epidural, oftentimes when it does come time to start to push, we will turn the epidural off or turn it down so that you can get a little bit more sensation back so you feel like you're in more control when you push. Um, so is there a downside to an epidural? No, there's not. And it's the same prize at the end. I always want to stress that for people. Some women get really caught up in this whole notion that if they don't have natural childbirth, somehow they did something wrong or they weren't strong enough or it's just nonsense. It's the same prize at the end. You want a healthy baby, you want a good experience. If your experience is not good because you're in so much pain that things are dragging on and on, then you need to try a different strategy. And that's why our midwives are present at the hospital to help you make those decisions and to be with you and to help guide you through this very unfamiliar territory. All right, well, thank you all so much for your participation. I hope this answered a lot of your questions. But again, certainly send messages through the portal. Again, I'm Patricia Gould. If you have questions, send them to me. I'm happy to answer them for you. And please download the app. It really does have a lot of really helpful information on it. Thank you. Thank you.